I may have heard that song a little boy about seven years old. I believe he was about seven years old sang that at, in Delaware Baptist Church in Grove, Oklahoma. And I thought that was a pretty song. I really liked it. And uh, Bill, you did a real good job. And, and I thought he did a real good job with the choir, even though it was on the wrong page, don't you? <laughs> and, and I think Shannon did an excellent job of playing it. I mean, just told her wrong number and she just played it. He was talking about our musicians going off to college, and, and I really hate that. And I can't control Crystal at all, but Shannon's going to take her college correspondence course. <laughs> We're not going to let her leave town. We're going to... <laughs> And Crystal, if I have anything to say about it, you're going to take the same course. So, all right. I, I always look forward to going to Falls Creek. Uh, you know, I get to see all the young people here at church, but I don't get to really spend any time with them. And so Falls Creek is a time when I can just really be with the young people for a whole week and really get to know them and set a good example for them. And uh, I always try to do that. In fact, I've already started. I was already telling Colin and... Crystal, things not to do to the girls down there. Uh, like, don't... Who did I say? No, no, I didn't tell Crystal. I told Colin and, and uh, Chris, don't put... Whatever you do, boys, don't put cracker crumbs in their bed. Don't put strawberry Kool-Aid in the shower heads. Don't do those things. Those aren't nice. They, I'm very creative, and I always try to think the things they wouldn't think about, so they'll be sure not to do those things. <laughs> But, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we get in a lot of trouble down there, but we sure have a lot of fun. We just really do, and it's a, such a spiritual time. I don't know of anybody that's gone that hasn't come back spiritually uplifted. If you don't, it's your own fault. It's just because you weren't open and to receive what God had for you. They have excellent classes, excellent preaching. And uh, I, I'm just really praying. We got the biggest, probably the biggest group going this uh, year. Where's Kathy? I can't. Is she back? Oh, there she is. I always look to her. See, she keeps all the facts and the figures. Largest group we've ever had. And I just think that's wonderful. And uh, I hope every one of them come back just spiritually charged. This morning I was studying and uh, the phone rang. Susie was studying and I was studying and the phone rang at 6.30 and I thought, who in the world would be calling me 6.30 in the morning? It was Kevin Chronic, and he was calling from Houston, Texas. I, when he left to go up there, I said, Kevin, you just call me. Call me Clay. And boy, he does. He's not bashful. He's called me twice now. And he's not short-winded. Boy, he just talks. But I was so glad to hear from him. He was so happy this morning. He said that he gave me some real good news. You know, when he was here in, in Tulsa, Kevin, they found, has cancer. He's just 30 years old, but he, he has cancer, and they give up on him here in Tulsa, and they send him to Houston. And he's been down there two or three times. I think this is about his third time. You may know more about it. And uh, he went back this time at, for 21 days, and the doctors told him, they said, now, the chemical we're going to give you this time is devastating. He said, you will be one sick person expect a rough time and he's to stay 21 days he called me on the phone he said I'm coming home tomorrow he said I have not been sick at all one time he said and I've been out walking from three to five miles every day and he said that they tested these tumors and there's something called marks. I didn't understand it, but they, they test enzymes or something to see if the, if the tumors have disappeared. And he said one of the tests, they run two, two different kinds of tests. And on one of the tests, it was 500 and it's down to 45. And the other one was 900 and it's down to 7. And they said that the doctors, the, the, what I understood from it was that the chemical that he took, the... the uh, chemotherapy will go ahead and take care of the remaining little bit. And uh, so they released him. Now he'll have to go back for two more treatments as insurance, you know, just to, you know, to be sure that they got it all. But he was just elated, and he said, I'll be in church next Sunday. Now, he lost all of his hair. He took chemotherapy, and he said, I'll be the one with the suntanned head. <laughs> And he said, tell the song leader I won't need a clean fork and a clean plate. Do you remember when you gave him? That was kind of an old joke. He's such a nice guy, and I really feel like God has got 
a, a, a purpose for his life. He's got a purpose for everybody's life, but he's got such a personality and he's so likable. God can really use him if he'll just... And, and I talked to him quite a while before he went down there and tried to explain how God wants to use him. He wants to use everybody. If you belong to God, he saved you for a purpose, and that's to glorify him. And he's got a reason for sparing Kevin. And I want him to know that. And so you really be praying for Kevin uh, that he'll continue to improve and that he'll get in God's work and stay in God's work. Amen. This, this morning I'm going to preach a, a different kind of a sermon. It, uh, on Sunday mornings I always preach evangelistic. But this morning it, it doesn't really call for an altar call. Now we'll give an altar call. Uh, we always give an altar call, but this is a different, it's, it's more of an exhortation to the church. And uh, I like to say, I really love the church. And my wife was telling me the other day, uh, not joyfully, but she was saying, you know, when we get back in Falls Creek, we just got about three more weeks and then school starts. I said, yeah, I know it. <laughs> you know, she's not wanting it to start, but I am. Because I want to tell you, I miss everybody in the summertime. When they're gone, uh, uh, I'm glad that Paul and Carol's back and, and uh, yes, Darlene and just everybody that goes away on, on vacation. We're glad these, they're here and we want you here every Sunday morning. And, and uh, we're, just, we're, we're always glad when people come back. And when school starts, it seems like everybody's back in pocket and we can get to work on our Sunday school again. And Can't we, Jeff? Wade, can't we? All right, I wanted to get them guys committed right now. And we're going to work in Sun School and get some more people saved, and that's what it's all about. And, and you know, uh, you can really get spoiled to come to church on Sunday morning. The choir's full and the church is full and people sitting downstairs and the place is just running over. And I really like that because I know that the Spirit is working. And whenever you have a crowd like that, people are being blessed. And that's what church is all about is that you'll be blessed. And if you're blessed, then you'll work for God. That's the whole purpose is to... to teach you to where you grow closer to God and be useful in his service. And so this morning, turn to uh, Hebrews, if you will. Now, we've been having a Bible study on Sunday night out of Hebrews. A lot of times when you're studying a Bible or, or studying that particular book, well, sermons will just kind of spring out of that. And by, you know, when I'm studying a certain book, well, just sermons will come out of that. And so I would like to preach on the first chapter, I mean, the first verse of chapter 12. And I'll give you a little background and, and uh, I won't go into great length and primarily I'll be speaking about Daniel. And uh, I was really blessed while I was studying this. And uh, I will read two verses. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul is concluding chapter 11. He says, because of what I've said in chapter 11, then he's admonishing them. In chapter 11, he gives the heroes of faith. He gives examples of all the heroes of faith, Samson and Gideon and all of those great, uh, great saints of the Old Testament that had such great faith. And then he starts out by saying, wherefore, or because, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, and naturally Christ is the main example, and that goes on through chapter 12. And we know that Christ is primarily our example. He went through trials nobody ever went through, but the apostle, here, the apostle Paul here is speaking of a great cloud of witnesses. What's he talking about? The great cloud of witnesses is the saints. The Old Testament saints that have the same trials, the same problems you have, but yet successfully run the race that was set before them. And they are witnesses to the church today that we don't 
have any excuse. I'm always hearing people say, well, times are worse now than they ever were. It was no worse than it was in Noah's day. It was so wicked in Noah's day, he had to destroy the world. But he was faithful to God. Now, one of the witnesses that I would like to call up, but like I say, Daniel will probably be my primary witness. And I would like to look at the life of Daniel. That was one remarkable man, that Daniel. The Bible says that God called him Daniel, greatly beloved. God really loved Daniel. We're going to find out why God really loved Daniel. But the Bible starts off saying that Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? Enoch, his thoughts was continually on God. He was a man that prayed without ceasing. He was a man that was constantly in communication with the Father. He walked with God to the extent that God took him. I heard a preacher say this about Enoch one time. He said, said, you know, I believe God and Enoch was out walking one day and they walked and they walked and they walked. I don't remember who t- or where I heard this story. Who? Little girl. Little girl told it. I don't know. I didn't remember. He said, they just out and they walked and walked and walked and finally God said, you know what, Enoch? We're closer to my house than we are yours. Let's just go on to my house. And the chariot just took him on home. You know, now, now here's the point. Enoch's saying this as a witness. You do have time for God. It's not that you don't have time for God. It's a matter of priorities. Yes. You take time for God. Why? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. People say, I don't have time. I wish I had time. Look, you take time for God. Amen. You know, I was very blessed. Uh, my mother has many brothers. She had eight brothers and two, three sisters. Well, there's three girls and eight or nine boys. But two of those uncles, uh, I'll never forget. They really stand out in my life because two of them, out of all those brothers, walked with God. And so I know what they're talking about when they're talking about walking with God. I mean, they, 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 if you don't want to talk about the Bible, don't go around them. And they don't know nothing about fishing. They ain't going to talk hot rods. But if you want to talk Bible, you come around. And uh, my Uncle Floyd was a bricklayer. He had a job. You say, well, I would like to be closer to God, but I have a job. He had a job. He was a bricklayer. That was hard work. And he was constantly traveling everywhere he went. But everywhere he was going, he was talking about Jesus. And he went all out through the West, New Mexico, and every place he stopped for any length of time, he started a church. He started the biggest church in Amarillo, Texas, years and years ago. It started out in his garage with a little Sunday school. He was a man that always talked about Jesus, always walking with God. And then my Uncle Jess, now he was something else. Uh, You all heard me speak of my Uncle Jess that lived at Grove. I mean, when you walk in the door, he's like John the Baptist. You know what it said about John the Baptist? It said he came preaching. You know, he didn't come to preach, he came preaching. And, and, and that's the way Jess was. When you walk in the door, he was already talking about Jesus. He didn't whether you got there, you know. <laughs> if you had to talk to yourself, he was talking about Jesus. And my wife and I was going down to see him one time. She said, now just how long do you think you'll be there before he starts giving you Bible lessons? And I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know. I said, because that's just the way it was. I said, it's interesting to say we knocked on the door. They said, came in. As soon as I opened the door, I mean, just as soon as I opened the door, he didn't say, hello, how are you? Do you have a hard trip, a good trip, or anything? As soon as I opened the door, he started right out. I said, hey, I'm going to tell you something, boy. And he just started right out. <laughs> he just, I mean, as soon as I opened the door, he was preaching. Bang, just like that. He was constantly thinking about Jesus. I mean, but he knew that Bible too. Now, he didn't have to go hunt his Bible up. I'll tell you where it was. It was either in his hand, on his lap, or right here at the coffee table. He was a man that walked with God. He was a bricklayer. He worked hard. But everywhere he was, he still had God on his mind. That's what it means to walk with God. Enoch said, I did it. You can do it. Don't tell me you don't have time for God. Yes, but you see, I've got to go to work. and I, Don't tell me that. Other men work, but they walk with God. He's a witness that you can do it. You see, we've all got a race to run. Now, the race that you run is not a physical race. We don't get out here and do a foot race, but it's the Christian life that you live. And you run with your eye upon a crown. You know, I hear people say this all the time. Well, I don't work for rewards. No, because you don't understand what the rewards are. You see? 
I don't want a crown. Well, if you're talking about a big heavy piece of gold or something sitting on my head that I've got to walk around with, no, I don't either. But you see, those are representative. Those are representative of the glory that you'll have in heaven. The position that you'll have in heaven. You say, do you believe there's degrees in heaven? I certainly do. I certainly do. What does the Bible say? It says the apostles shall rule over the twelve tribes of Israel. Sure, there's degrees in heaven. I have a cousin that brought us hail. He's a missionary, and he explained it this way, and I thought it was the best example I ever heard about rewards. He said, you can take a quart fruit jar, and you can take a little bitty, little bitty jigger, I guess you'd call it. And he said, you can fill both of them completely full of water. Fill them both completely full of water. He said, just completely full of water. And he said, both of those are completely full. But he said, one has a lot more capacity than the other. In other words, he said, here's the, what I'm trying to say. When you get to heaven, you're going to be just as happy as you can be. But you see, some will have far more capacity for joy than others because of what they did. Now, let me give you a little illustration. Now, there's Christians that's going to glory that have never heard of Moses. Believe that or not? They don't know who David is. They don't know who Abraham is. They don't. But listen, those of us who do and have read their life story and have meditated, man, I'm going to be glad to see them people. You see, those that have served the Savior and walked with the Savior for years and years, listen, he's going to mean a lot different to them than somebody that got saved and went their way. He said, when you run your race, keep your eye on the crown. And he said, there's witnesses that have done it. And they're, they're cheering you on, saying, you can do it. You can do it. What about Moses? What a great man Moses. God said that of all the prophets, he said, I spoke to him in visions and dreams. He said, Moses, face to face. Moses was a great man before God ever called him. Did you know that? You know who Moses was? Do you have any idea who Moses was? He was the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we know that Moses was a little Jewish baby that was put in the bulrushes and the, and the Pharaoh's daughter uh, found him and raised him. But listen, he was a prince in Egypt. Man, he had it made. He had the very best education. He wore the royal robes. He had the royal ring on his hand. But you know what the Bible says? He said he would rather suffer the reproaches of God's people than to be called Pharaoh's daughter. Now, he's a witness, friend. He says, listen, this world ain't got that much to offer. He said, it's better to be a Christian than to be the richest man on the earth. It's better to be a Christian than have more influence and power than anybody on the earth. He said, I gave it all up and suffered with the Israelites. And he said, you can too. If you want to win a race, he said, give it all up and suffer with God's people. He said, I did it and you can do it. What about David? Now, David was a man after God's own heart. Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he was a good moral man, right? No. David, listen, David, you know, here's something about, about all these Bible characters. We think, well, yeah, but look who they are. I mean, there's Abraham and all. Listen, they were flesh and blood. They weren't gods. They weren't half angelic beings. They were flesh and blood. Great as Elijah was, it said he, suffered, he, uh, he was subject to the same passions you are. You know what? Old Elijah got scared. Anybody here ever get scared? He got scared. Anybody here ever get hungry? He got hungry and almost died from hunger. Angels fed him. He was just like we are. But they ran the race and they won the race. They won the crown. And they said, you can do it too. David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he had faith. You know what David could say this morning as a witness? Hey, church. One time there was a Goliath in my life. But through the power of the Lord, I overcame him and slew him. And you might have Goliath in your life that's keeping you from serving God. But listen, God will give you the victory. Don't quit the race because of Goliath. Be strong in the Lord. He's a witness. And then we get to Daniel. You know, until I really started studying the book of Daniel, I knew he was a great man, the Bible said he was, but I really didn't appreciate all that Daniel went through. 
What a great man, this Daniel. The Bible says that he had a very sweet spirit. Good attitude. Good disposition. Very likable person. Turn, to, if you will, to the book of Daniel. I want to show you some things about Daniel. And I'll tell you what. Now, we know we're to pattern life after Christ, but I'll tell you what, that's what Daniel did. And we're going to notice some things about Daniel that we can all learn from. And, and, and I'll tell you what, it, God really spoke to me through the book of Daniel. And I hope he speaks to you. Now, first of all, I want to tell you something about Daniel. Daniel was of a royal lineage. How many knew that? Of the Israelites. He, he was a prince. But Nebuchadnezzar came over to Judah and took them all captive. Brought them down into Babylon. Now, here Daniel is. Now, you notice something now. Daniel goes from being a prince to a slave immediately. Bang. And not only that, the king made him a eunuch. But do you know what? There's a good lesson in this. Daniel didn't become bitter. You think about it. He didn't become bitter. He didn't hold grudges. Now you think of what they did to that young man. Took him captive, made him a eunuch, and made a slave out of him. But he did not become bitter. You know, uh, there's been times in my life I take a fly swatter or a board or something and I hit a wasp. We've all done that. Knock a wasp down. Mortally wound him. And you ever notice what a wasp will do? It'll sting himself to death. Did you ever notice that? Boy, they'll curl up and sting themselves. And you know that's where a lot of people are? Boy, I tell you, they get their feelings hurt and they'll just sting themselves. They fill their system full of poison. They destroy their selves. And I believe if there's any sin that will close the floodgate of God's blessings, it's the sin of bitterness. Just plain old holding a grudge. Being bitter towards people. Listen, that'll eat you like a cancer. To be bitter, you don't hurt the person you're bitter at. But boy, it'll just eat you up inside and God can't use you. But do you know why Daniel wasn't bitter? Do you know why Daniel? You know, we could all get bitter. I don't know why I had to be born in a little town like Sandsbury. My brothers got to go to college. They wouldn't send me to college. Blah, 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 blah. I could go on and on and on and be bitter. But the reason Daniel wasn't bitter because he believed in the providence of God. He said, I'm here in Babylon because God put me here in Babylon. Now, it's, it's amazing how his life parallels Joseph's life. Now, there's two men in the Bible... I mean, of great renown, Daniel and Joseph. Now, David, it te God tells about David's sin. He tells about Abraham's sin. He tells about Moses' sin. But you won't find anywhere where God says anything that Daniel ever did wrong or Joseph did wrong. But now look at, at Joseph's attitude. He was all right. He was doing okay. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't sinned against the father. And his old brother sold him into slavery. Well, Lord... I've been good to you all my life, and I've served you best I can. I'm just where I'm going to turn out, well, you can just forget it. See, he could have got better towards God, but he didn't. He wound up in Egypt. Okay, then they, he, they went to work for Potiphar. And he was good. Boy, I mean, everything he did, Potiphar blessed. I mean, he was over all of his household, and oh, he did a wonderful job for Potiphar. He was falsely accused and thrown in prison. Boy, that ought to make you better, hadn't it? But he wasn't bitter. You know why I know he wasn't bitter? Because it said that he found favor in the eyes of the prisoners. He had a good spirit. He didn't hold grudges. He believed in the providence of God. He said, I'm here for a reason. Now, do you remember later on in the story when his brothers came down there to buy, to buy uh, uh, corn because of the famine? He eventually told them, he said, now boys, he said, brothers, I want to tell you something. Now, when you sold me into Egypt, you did it for my harm. But he said, God had a reason for it. God sent me down here to preserve the nation of Israel. See, he believed in the providence of God. And so did Daniel. No matter what God's done, I'm not going to gripe and I'm not going to grumble and I'm not going to be mad at the Babylonians because I believe in the providence of God. Now, another thing that Daniel had, he had commitment. If Daniel's going to witness, he says, don't be bitter. Listen, run your race and don't be bitter. No matter what trials you're going through, 
Don't be bitter towards God because God will be glorified in it. God's got a reason for what you're going through right now. And he had commitment. Now, Daniel was a young, good-looking man and there was three other Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says they were fair. You know, they were young, strong, good-looking young men, smart. And the king said, I want you to take... Out of all these Israelite, Israelite children, the young men, those are the smartest. I want you to bring them in and we're going to train them and teach them for three years and then they can stand in my presence as counselors and as wise men. Well, when they brought Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought him up there and, and the king says, now I'm going to feed them off my table. In other words, they're going to eat the same thing I do. They're going to have the best food available. Man, they're going to have the pork chops and... Man, they're going to have the wine and all that. Now, now notice, King David was very committed. I mean, Daniel, very committed. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself by eating the king's meat. Why, he was a Jew. He couldn't eat pork. See, they ate certain types of food and spices that was unlawful for Jews. You know, I get so sick of hearing people talk about peer pressure today. You talk about peer pressure. Here's a slave saying he ain't going to eat what the king tells him to eat. He could have lost his neck. Did you know that? But he purposed in his heart. He was committed to God that he would not eat the king's meat. Now, I want to tell you about the other three. Now, here's something about it. When you live for God, you're always going to influence somebody else. You're always going to be a good influence for somebody else. And he influenced three other young Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar made the big golden statue? And he said, now any time you hear the sound of the trumpets and all these musical instruments, everybody in the nation is to fall down and worship. Well, they'd blow the trumpets and everybody in the nation would fall down. But there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing out like a sore thumb. There's only three still on their feet. And they run to the king and said, Hey, there's three Hebrews over here. They don't care much for your God. When you sound the trumpets, they don't fall on their face. He said, Bring them here. And they brought Shadrach, Meshach. Boy, a good lesson than this. They'll be a witness too against you. They brought him up there and the king said, Is it true what I hear? That when I sound the horns and the trumpets and all those musical instruments, you don't worship? And you know what they said? Now, now, now notice where we come from. Now, now here's the way we do. We always weigh the consequences. Now, if I don't, this is going to happen. See, they said, we don't even consider it, King. They said, we're not careful to answer thee. We're not going to say, ooh, boy, you better watch what you say, man. He's going to have your neck in the noose. He said, he said, we're not careful to answer you. But the king said, now, wait a minute. If I throw you in the fire furnace, who is that God that can deliver you out of my hand? They said, we're not careful to answer to you. He said, let me tell you something, big boy. If our God wants to get us out of the fire first, he can. But, now here's where the commitment comes in. This is dedication. Whether he does or whether he doesn't, we're not serving your false gods. Boy, now that's commitment, isn't it? See, we always weigh the situation. Man, if I do that, I might get fired, so better not do it. Listen, do it because it's right. Listen, they were willing to die for their convictions, and they say, you're able to do the same thing. Don't tell me you can't do it. You know, years ago, I, I remember this happening. I was a little kid when it happened, but I heard my dad tell about it. Years ago, when Safeway was right downtown, 2nd and Main, some of us old-timers remember when it was right there on the corner. Well, there was a butcher that worked there for Safeway, and about that time, Safeway decided they was going to start selling beer. Well, the butcher, the, the, the butcher walked up to the manager, and he said, I quit. He said, I'm not working in a place that sells beer. And the manager says, well, it's company policy. There's nothing I can do about it. He says, well, then I quit. And he walked out that do door unemployed because of his convictions. He turned and walked right down the street a half a block, walked in Jitney Jungle, asked him if they needed a butcher. They hired him and paid him more money than he was making it Safeway. But the point is this. The point is this. He didn't know when he walked out he had a job. He walked out because it's the right thing to do. Hey, young people, you don't have to work where they sell beer. You don't have to. You can go hungry first. You can do what's right. See? You can do what's right if you lose your job. But I'll tell you what, I believe God's going to take care of it. 
You need commitment. I want to tell you something. Some people come to church. Some people come to Sunday school. Not just when they feel like it, because it's right. It's a right thing to do. And like David, their heart is fixed and they purposed in their heart they're going to do what's right before God. But you know what? Daniel, we can really learn a lesson from Daniel too. He was a man of convictions, but he wasn't belligerent. You know, there's a difference. See? He didn't walk up to that guy and say, oh, you're crazy if you think I'm going to eat that stuff. You know, I've seen people like that, you know. Boy, I'll grab you and just thump you on the chest, man. Here's what I believe. No. See, he wasn't like that. Listen, he was wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Knowing full well God would take care of him. So he goes to the, the man over the prison, the prince of the eunuchs. And he said, sir. He said, I can't eat this stuff. It would defile me. I'm a Jew. He said, let me and my friends here just eat bean soup. He said, oh man, the king's going to cut my head off if I do. Because then when you appear before the king, the rest of them's going to be fat and sassy and you're going to be skinny as bean poles. Oh no, I'd lose my life. He said, well, he said, well, no, wait a minute. He said, let's just try it for 10 days and see how we turn out. See, he knew God was going to take care of him. But he was going to do what's right regardless. But he handled it tactfully. There's a, I've got a set of tapes at home that a man made that's a personal soul winner and he has personally led thousands of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. He witnesses everywhere in the filling stations, in the restaurants, door to door. He's just constantly winning souls to the Lord. And He, he told one particular... He, he just does all kinds of stuff. He said he found out... Now, this is back before it was illegal to throw trash out the window. He found out, he said, that he could be driving along and if you hold a track down out the window like this and release it, it'll flip over the top of the car and land on the sidewalk over here. But if you hold it up like this, it will, the wind will catch it and blow it over here. I mean, he had it down to a science. And he said, oh, he was paying that, but he didn't go everywhere with tracks, leave them in restaurants and everywhere. And he said, if you leave a track in a restaurant, always leave a tip. He said, don't be a cheap Christian. But anyway, he said, he was driving down the street one day in like four lanes, way over here to the right, and there was a sailor over hitchhiking going the other way. And he said, I whipped out a track, put it up here, and he said, honk, honk, honk. And he said, I got his attention. And I released the track, and he said, it blew right over, landed right at that sailor's feet. He said, three months later, he said, I was in a, was in a big, uh, uh, kind of an all-church type meeting where all the churches come together and they have a big fellowship. And he said, they're having a testimony service. He said, a sailor stood up and said, I want to tell you what happened to me three months ago. He said, I was hitchhiking. And he said, some nut, and he told the old green car, he said, honk, honk, honked at me, and I got, looked at him, then he threw trash at me. And he said, it flew right down there and lit my feet, and he said, I was wondering what that was, and he said, I picked it up, and there's a gospel track, and I got saved. Well, after the meet, he went to him and said, I was the man that threw that track out. But he was always doing stuff like that. But here's what he said in that. He said, I'm always hearing people say, Boy, if you go knock the Lord the doors for Jesus, you better be prepared to have people cuss you out and slam doors in your face. And he said, I've never had anybody slam a door in my face or cuss me out. But he said, I don't insult them either. He said, you've got to be polite. Kind sir, could I give you this track? It'll tell you how to go to heaven. Thank you. He said, always be a gentleman. And Daniel was a gentleman. He had convictions, but he was a gentleman. He used tact. Another thing about Daniel. Let me show you some other things about Daniel. Oh, I'm running out of time. I might have to finish this tonight. I don't know. Daniel was such a good man. You might say he was too good for his own good. He was such a good man and a good administrator, such a good ruler that Nebuchadnezzar put him over the whole kingdom. He was Nebuchadnezzar's right hand man. He was over all the 120 princes and the providences and all those princes would answer to him and they became very jealous. And they said, we got to get rid of this Daniel. And they said, well how are we going to do it? They said, the only thing we can find wrong with him is that he worships God. So 
they hatched up a plan. They said, okay, let's go to Nebuchadnezzar and, and tell him, say, oh, and they did. You know, boy, flattery will go a long ways. But like they say, flattery is like perfume. Smell it, but don't drink it. But Nebuchadnezzar took a slug of it. They come and said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're so great. We want you to pass a law that for 30 days nobody can pray to anybody except you. He said, all right. So he passed the law, sealed it with the, with the agreement of the Medes and Persians. And that's a contract you could not alter or change. Well, they knew Daniel was a praying man. And you know what? When they come told Daniel, said, Daniel, you know what? Here's what they've done. So you better not pray for 30 days. You know what Daniel did? Said he went to his prayer closet, opened the door towards Jerusalem, and prayed three times a day. You know what it says? As his custom was. You know when most of us pray when we get in trouble? Just before they throw us in the lion den, then we think, you know, we better cry prayer. But Daniel was a praying man before he ever got in trouble. He said, listen, if I can take out... Now listen, he says, I'm the president of Babylon. That's what he was, the president of Babylon. And he said, if I've got time to pray three times a day, now don't you people here at Calvary tell me you don't have time to pray. He's a witness. A great cloud of witnesses. You've got time to pray. I heard a story one time, I don't remember how it goes, some of you probably remembered about the guy that, I, I better not even tell it, I don't even remember it, how that he got up and had to go to work, he didn't have time to pray, and he got to work and he didn't get anything done, and so the next day he said, I, I've got to stop and pray because I don't have time not to, you know. Daniel started off his day of prayer, and you know something else he did? He prayed towards Jerusalem and he prayed, said, God, make thy face to shine upon thy sanctuaries. He had a good attitude, and here's what I'm saying. A lot of times when we pray, and I, I'll close with this. There's a lot more in this sermon, but a lot of times we pray and we'll say, Lord, bless Calvary Baptist Church. Lord, we pray that souls will be saved here. You know what? He had the right attitude. He saw the whole picture. He said, make thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary. You know what we ought to be praying? Lord, may people be saved everywhere Jesus is being lifted up. Lord, in every church in San Francisco where the gospel is being preached, Lord, save souls and add souls to those churches. We shouldn't be selfish about it. We can't get them all in here anyway. We found that out last winter, didn't we? We can't get them all in here. And you know what? A lot of times I say, where do you go to church? And they say, well, I go so-and-so. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I've been going there for years. I just say, praise God. Listen, we're not in competition with Broadway or Olivet or Trinity. We all work for the same Lord and the same God, and we ought to be praying for them just as they should be praying for us. Daniel said, Lord, make your face to shine upon thy sanctuaries. I'll tell you what. Sometimes we see the church as right here in these four walls. Listen, the church is all over the world. The church is on the mission fields. The church is some in prison. The church is some of are in bondage, you see. And he prayed for his people. Great as Daniel was, there he was the president, but he knew that he had Israelites that still in slavery right there in Babylon. You know, and here's something else. When we get to doing good, a lot of times we tend to forget those that aren't. Man, I'm not going through any trials. I'm not going through any trials. And we forget to pray for those that are. You know, God's blessed me with good health. And you know, it's, a lot of times it's hard for me to understand and to sympathize with people that never feel good. But Daniel wasn't that away. I mean, there Daniel was rich beyond measure. A prince there in Babylon. But he said, oh God, help my brothers and sisters, my, the Israelites' family. See, boy, he was a good man. He was a good man, greatly beloved of God. But the point's this, we have witnesses. Did you know that? And they're saying, I don't want to hear those excuses. Don't tell me about peer pressure. Daniel says, don't tell me about peer pressure. I know about peer pressure. Don't tell me about committed commitment. I know about commitment. See, don't tell me about how hard it is. You tell it to Jesus. He says, you want to see how hard it is? You want, to, you want to see what persecution is? Look at the nail prints. Look at the 
scars in my forehead and the wound in my side. You want to hear about persecution? See those apostles all lined up there without any head? They lost their necks. They resisted unto death. They run their race. They finished their course. And don't tell me you can't do it. It's all a matter of attitude. It's all a matter of do you want to. It's all a matter of what do you put first in your life. Do you put God first or do you put self first? That's what it all boils down to. Do I want to please me or do I want to please God? Let's stand. As Bill's coming, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for, uh, for thy great love wherein thou lovest us. Father, we're so thankful that you came and died for us. Father, we thank you that, that for your great mercy towards us. And Father, we know that we're in a, a race, Father. And we know so many times we do fail you. And so many times we get sidetracked. But Father, we just pray that you'll ever be with us and that you'll always guide us and lead us and help us and strengthen us. And Father, we thank you for all these witnesses that have run the race before us and that encourage us uh, to go on and be true to you. And Father, help us to examine our hearts this morning. And if there's any besetting sin, if there's anything there, Lord, whether it's anger, whether it's just uh, not being committed, uh, vanity, pride, whatever that stands in our way and keeps us from running the race and winning the crown, Father, we pray this morning when it's come and lay it on the altar. Bless the word that's preached. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.